Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Horasis USA meeting 2022. This is the panel for boosting the role of civil society. I am Diana Sabrin, CEO and co-founder of Wanagrix, and it is great to be able to moderate what is really a timely discussion, looking at the recent news on the various strifes and disruptions within communities around the globe. Before I dive further into this conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists for today. We have a diverse group of voices here across three time zones. And firstly, all the way from Australia, we have Peta Marianne, founder of Future Narrative. Peta is an award-winning journalist who is regularly quoted in publications, including the BBC, Financial Times, Guardian and Telegraph, to name a few. She is a futurist who has worked in retail and lifestyle industries for more than a decade. She's also an um, on-demand keynote speaker at events including World Retail Congress in Dubai, Web Summit in Lisbon, and Shop Talk in Las Vegas. She has degrees in psychology and English from the Uni University of Melbourne. And then next, in Canada, we have Calvin D'Souza. Now, Calvin, hello. Um, he's an associate director in Crawl's Forensic Investigations and Intelligence Practice in Toronto. He advises a wide range of clients, including corporations, law firms, and government bodies on a vari variety of matters, including complex investigation and cross-border transactions, including business risk, due diligence, commercial issues, and fraud. He has lived and worked in Europe, Asia, and North America. And then finally, we have Ernesto Nunes, Chief Executive Officer for Love for All Mexico. Now, Ernesto is a serial entrepreneur, social innovator, passionate about human rights, co-founder and board member of Ernesto, I'll try to do justice here, okay. Um, Illuminamos por el estimo. Is that, is that okay? L light for the autism in Mexico. Lighting for the autism in Mexico. Yes. Thank you so much. And he's the founder and CEO, as I've mentioned, for Love for All, a festival which builds consciousness about diversity and encourages the inclusion of minorities in families, companies to improve their representation in Mexican society. So now, thank you very much, all of you three panelists, um, get your, you know, from getting away from your busy schedule to join us today. Now let's dive into this discussion. So I'll introduce what we are going to speak about today and then leave the questions to all of you. So today's topic is around the role of civil society. Now we know that civil society activities frequently enhance democracy by stimulating open and informed debate, much like what we have today on this panel. Many global civic groups and associations exist that challenge established agendas, methodologies, explanations and prescriptions regarding political, economic, cultural and environmental issues. However, we also know that, you know, it, the difficult relationships exist between civil society and government and are often caused by a lack of trust and a lack of accurate information and is often the case misinformation as well. So civil society often plays a watchdog role and holds governments and institutions to account, such as monitoring human rights abuses. They also advocates they, they also advo advocate raising awareness of issues and giving a voice to the marginalized. So for example, we see across the world from Bangladesh's ready-made common industry to the Black Lives Matters and Ottawa truckers protests to ongoing climate change issues. So now this brings us to the first area of discussion regarding the changing role that civil, civil society plays in a democracy and if this is a cause for worry for governments. Now, Peta, what changing role will the private sector play? How will this combat the issues around the eroding sense of trust and truth in political discourse? The mic is for you, Peta. Okay, thank you so much for organizing this panel, Diana. It's really exciting to be here, um, as always, at, at the Horace events. But um, the thing I think I wanted to talk about today is really what we're seeing is, you know, people are getting increasingly angry about some of the things that governments are doing and their lack of action. And obviously, we're seeing a lot of, uh, particularly in developed uh, economies, that hollowing out of middle class. 
And in that, we're seeing lots more activism and protests and things like that taking place. But then that activism isn't actually um, flowing down into some of those things where they can actually see direct action with government. So say, for instance, like in the voting and stuff like that. So if you have if you go back a couple of years to what was happening in the US and, you know, Generation Z feeling like they're being left out by what's happening in government and there's a lot of protesting taking place, particularly around things like Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, they're not necessarily always doing the things that would help themselves around voting, for instance, and participating in, in local government and stuff like that. There is a, a, sh a small shift that's taking place, but it is that sort of disconnect between, you know, a, a distrust of what's happening in government but also um, a, uh, a lack of action in the areas where they might actually be able to um, drive change. And, and one of the things we're seeing, and to go back to your actual question, which is to say that, you know, consumers actually and, and people trust uh, companies and businesses more to enact change uh, than they do governments at the moment. And, and that's a really, see I mean, it's, it's a shift that's been taking place for a long time. But there was a, a, an uplift in trust at the start of the pandemic. And this is uh, data from the Edelman Trust Barometer, a, a study that looks at about 36,000 people each year. And, uh, and it's a global one. Um, but really what we're seeing is that that sense of loss of faith in government and, and really a look to, to other sorts of organizations to be able to help people instead. And, and really they're looking to the private sector to be able to do that. And so it really shifts a lot of that responsibility towards those private sector organizations to be making sure that they're doing the right thing. And it's, it's a lot to ask really, because fundamentally the private sector is a commercial entity it's not, uh, you know, really driven by people. But then, you know, uh, again, it starts to you start to then question what it, a company needs to do to be able to make sure that it has longevity in a market. Um, but yeah, it's a very complex situation because if you look at some of the stuff that's happening, and obviously the big news story at the moment with what's happening in the awful things that are happening in Ukraine, you know, we're seeing companies takes uh you know four sanctions against russia and pull out of russia in a way that the governments the, in the company that the companies are, are in aren't able to do or aren't choosing to do at this stage and so it, it's really interesting to see those organizations flex their flex their muscles when governments perhaps are not feeling as confident to be able to do so thank you very much better for your comments and now with what Peta has mentioned about distrust, disconnect. And so this brings in to where I want to pull in Kelvin here for your views on the role of civil society that has changed in an age of misinformation. So even perhaps even an overload of information. So we find ourselves in an information age where there is an overload of information through social media that like what um, Peta mentioned just now, Right, you talk about movements, social movements like hashtag Me Too, hashtag BLM, hashtag Ottawa Truckers. So now, Kelvin, would you say that in some cases there is a politicize, um, politicization of social media? And following that, what are the key effects that can have on governments and the policies they put in place? Excellent. Thank you, uh, Diana, and thank you, everyone, for joining me today on this panel. It's a pleasure to speak to speak with all of you today um, the, on this forum. I think what what has changed very rapidly over the last few years is just the manner in which causes from civil society are now more widely disseminated in real time. So an event could happen where PETA is in Melbourne, in Australia today and in the morning taken up across North America by people who say share the same beliefs, whether it's around BLM, climate change, uh, any sort of topic of conversation. And this can sometimes set in motion a chain of events that neither government nor private sector or even social media organizations are actually able to control. So the 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 role of information and this mass dissemination of information means you could have two broad effects in some ways a lot of information highlights issues that may not come may, may not be kind of you know front page news say 10 15 20 years ago but now people are able to kind of see witness perhaps you know acts of injustice um you know videos of for example with you know the situation in ukraine or or you know protests around the world 
which might not have made into the public domain in that manner are now widely available. Now, this has a, a positive effect in terms of kind of the widespread, uh, you know, the widespread dissemination of information. On the flip side, my concern has always been is that we are now very, very quickly expected in real time to react to things that over, you know, over the normal course of how decisions are made, both in the private sector and governments, would involve more fruitful discussion between opposing sides, rather than sort of hashtags, people kind of walking out on each other online, in person. If I don't agree with everything that you've said, that's the end of the conversation. And so what we're basically living through now is even within civil society, say on an issue like climate change, you could have people who essentially live in two different factoids of the universe when it comes to a topic. And what may be seen as factual and what may not be seen as factual, I may be able to quote you something from The Guardian, somebody else quotes you something from The Telegraph, and your worlds don't meet. So the, the, the issue is we have a lot of information. We do not have a lot of quality information. And we don't also now agree on what the standard is. And so the, the, I guess this kind of filters back in from sort of civil society to government and how in most, you know, developed countries, democracies and the political parties that run them are gradually becoming further and further polarized. So you don't actually have the sorts of debates that you could have a long time ago. Not, not, it's not very fashionable, for example, to call oneself a centrist these days. So, um, I mean, a lot, a lot to un- unpack here, but I think in general, the age of information or misinformation and, 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 there, and just one more point I would also like to say, and actually, you know, to, to what Petter said sort of earlier, the, the, it has been interesting over the last few days to see how the private sector has sort of reacted with respect to kind of events in Ukraine and how, you know, they sort of, you know, certain investment firms have sort of pulled out of Russia. Certain brands won't, you know, won't Apple won't sell their products there. And obviously, for all the years leading up to today, you know, a lot of these things were perhaps went, you know, at the center of private sector decision making. Again, as Pat has said, a lot of these these firms are commercial organizations. So you you now realize that the winds have shifted. It isn't profitable anymore to be you know, in, in a country like that. So um, a lot of different things to unpack, but I, I, I sort of will, will leave you with this sort of suggestion that the age of information has led to a lot of, you know, dissemination of misinformation, which has, in its sense, led to a lot of polarization. Thank you so much, Kelvin. And um, I absolutely agree on the part where you touch upon the point of instant reaction. It's like akin to instant gratification. You know, you do not have time to digest the information, to react, and then you are absolutely pressured to, 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 to give the like emoticon or the smiley emoticon and all those emojis. So absolutely understand that. Now, let's park that thoughts and now let's move on to um, Ernesto. So Ernesto, one of the roles in civil society is as a service provider. And how service providers work in this um, society is they build social capital, they build trust and shared values which are transferred into the political sphere and shared values and help to hold society together. They They work to promote democracy and to defend human rights, advocating awareness and change. Now, civil society fulfills this socialization function by providing citizens with opportunities to form and seek membership in organizations that work for their interests. And I know this is true for your organization, Ernesto. So can you tell us about the role that your organization plays in raising awareness of issues in Mexico, giving a voice to the marginalized? And can you tell us more about how organization is at, your organization is advocating a change in Mexican society? Mm. Thank you, Diana. Hi, all. Thank you all for being here. Well, we we have hard times in Mexico since uh, we at this moment we have a very powerful president, maybe the most powerful one in the last thir- uh, thirty years, uh, whose strategy is focusing in uh, concentrating power, undermining institutions, civil society, opposition, uh, press and anyone 
who questions or expresses anything negative about, about his government. So as a social, uh, as a civil society, we uh, uh, have a strategic role at this moment, uh, trying to build trust in our institutions and protecting them. Um, he, this president uh, built a very powerful uh, propaganda platform. The, and so he uh, has every day a press conference from which he all the time uh, has a narrative, uh, negative narrative against uh, middle class uh, entrepreneurs, uh, big companies, and uh, dividing the country in the good ones and the evil ones. So our role is to um, to try to build social tissue uh, to protect our institutions, the trust in them, uh, to build um, confidence between citizens uh, and the same way uh, Calvin said, all the misinformation in the uh, digital platforms and, and, and the division of the conversation is becomes very hard to make this happen. Um, we, uh, since the very beginning, we have been trying to build conversations, constructive conversations between uh, all the stakeholders, but it has been uh, none of success till now. Um, at this moment, we try to protect one of the uh, most important instit institutions, that is the uh, Electoral Institute, that is the one with the more the most credibility in Mexico, uh, and it is at stake. So all this uh, narrative uh, is uh, uh, endangering our democracy. So our role has uh, been um, strategic uh, to try to keep uh, our rights, our spaces for, for discussion, and trying to build in bridges with the government to keep on going. Thank you very much, Ernesto. And I think a very brief two step for Mexicans and, you know, being the voice of change in the Mexican society. And I can already see points that, that could lead us to our next conversation. So now we, this is considered the round one of what we are discussing about. And it's all about trust. Um, misinformation. So now let's move towards how can we solve this? How can we actually empower change, right? And this is where, where Kelvin mentioned about information overload, um, instant, uh, you know, reactions to information. And then Peta mentioned about, you know, the different, you know, Peta, you talk about a sense of loss of trust in governments. And, and then, you know, for Ernesto, you talk about governments using platforms for propaganda. And this way, you know, I want to ask, and this is open to all of you, and maybe Peta could comment first, how is technology changing how we build conversations around civil society and changing decision-making processes? So it's very relevant to all three of you to what you've mentioned. And what does the future looks like in this regard? Can technology help develop trust in institutions and governments? Okay, there's so much in this and yes. there's so many things that we can talk about. So I'm going to try and keep it as concise as I can, but also yes. as expansive as possible, because I think there's a number of different um, uh, facets to this that are really worth unpacking a little bit further. Um, one of which obviously is um, how we consume information and how we consume news. There's been a really sharp uplift in the number of people that are getting their main news sources from social media. And, you know, even, you know, seeing in like the last few weeks, um, you know, that idea of if you haven't posted something on your Instagram about Ukraine, like, what are you doing? You're, you're not supporting what's happening as part of that effort. And, you know, and, and it's sort of leading to people posting stuff when they're completely misinformed. But also it's like the memification of crisis as well, which is really uh, horrendous from a, a, an emotional perspective, but obviously interesting from an academic one. Um, 
and and like sort of even stuff that, that you know that the ukrainians are doing you know where they've changed the street signs to i won't use the word because it's got swear words in it but you know that idea of those things that are capturing uh, people's imaginations and driving support internationally are actually kind of meme led um you know that those images of those those road signs that were changed that grandmother speaking to the um to the Russian um, soldiers saying that she would give him a uh, sunflower fit so, so that they would grow on his grave after he died in her country. And so it's really interesting to see, but that obviously, you know, that memification of crisis is really changing how we interact with information because obviously some people will see that and they will think that that, that they now know what's happening in in that particular situation and in that particular um circumstance and so it's really not creating a holistic view and then also you have like algorithmic information dissemination which then means that you know you're only ever seeing information that aligns with your perspective you know calvin spoke uh, uh really interestingly about this you know you get the guardian view you get the t telegraph view and never twain shall meet so you can never have a conversation that sits in the middle and looks at nuance around an idea so um so from that perspective obviously we've got a lot of problems when it comes to technology and um and how we understand somebody else's experience of the world and i think you know obviously that centrist view where, where you can take on multiple perspectives understand nuance um requires more sort of informed decision making and informed uh understanding of things which is really difficult to come to in in the current media and information dissemination landscape um but one of the things you wanted to talk about is the future and and obviously like i've come down pretty negatively on technology at the moment but one of the things i wanted to talk about that sort of we're seeing start to emerge is this idea of of DAOs and that that's a um de decentralized autonomous organizations and really seeing that kind of come through as this idea of places where people can can vote and so the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO is that you know you have um people contribute to something so say for instance there have been things around um in investments and stuff like that and, and you use the blockchain to do that but it allows people to vote on where, where the money goes or where that that stuff goes and so you know you can start to think about ways of you know participatory de democracy and participatory budget um expenditure in in uh communities being used in that way by that sort of those same sort of down mechanisms being applied to government obviously there are certain problems uh, that can kind of come about from this because it means that you know perhaps only the funding might only go to things that people feel connected to on any given day which sometimes isn't necessarily the best way mm. to use funding but it starts to kind of create that that sense of people feeling empowered because you know a lot of the problems that we're facing at the moment is that people and especially when we see some of the misinformation and right-wing things happening it's it, it's really coming from people feeling disempowered and feeling like you know the future is something that's out of their control and that it's happening to them and so they start to read some of these really dodgy news sources and then move into you know acting as if those things are true when you know a lot of those things aren't true and and it's um yeah so it's about kind of how, how do you start to i think there's two parts to this which is you know creating more participation and helping people feel empowered about what their future could look like and creating something that's hopeful because that is something that's actually really being challenged at the moment so again from that same study that i was talking about earlier um no no developed countries believe their families and self will be better off in five years time and that's no. a, a study of thirty six thousand people so if you start to think well there's no hope for me and things are going to be crap and bad like then you start to act in ways that are very selfish and self-serving you start to lose that sense of um community and communal good because you're constantly in this this mentality of lack and so really you know so it, it is kind of creating that sense of being empowered so that you can start to build towards something that feels better and looks better but it's also about um you know making sure that that there is space for nuance which is really hard when you're going through this, this sort of memification of crisis and and devastation so yeah that's kind of a start but like i could go on for probably an hour about this so i don't want to i don't want to uh steal from everybody else's uh, opportunity to comment on this as well no worries, Patam. A very good points there, and I, I really like when you say when you talk about uh, mimification of the crisis, and it's it's quite unfortunate, but then it is a reality of how the 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 world works as of now, and but now let's give Calvin an opportunity to comment on that question. 
Yeah, and 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 uh, Petter raises so many interesting points, and I, uh, with, with the fullness of time, would have loved to comment on all of them. But just a couple of uh, of 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 you know thoughts there on sort of the the information overload. So not only are you know do we sort of see memification and things like that, and people just reading a headline and liking it regardless of what what's kind of in the content. I think a lot of what seems to happen in the way people can consume news and information now is that they only consume stories that interest them maybe not just necessarily off their political view but i think of the times when you know one would listen to a 30 minute bbc news program globally and it would sort of start with the news maybe local news sport the weather and things like that but you actually had around you know even things that you didn't know you were interested in you followed or you listened to because that's what you did. You waited for, you know, if you if you wanted to, to, to see what the sports results were, you waited till minute 22 and things like that. Now, I think a lot of how consumption is done is that, you know, uh, it, it, it's amazing how news organizations survive because people literally click just what they want to. In terms of um, the, the another point that I guess Petter raised, which, I, which I'd really like to t- touch upon, is... Technology is great when we also have forums like this, where we're actually able to kind of have these conversations. It's not great sometimes. And the pandemic, I guess, exacerbated that in many ways when everyone was basically at home. And so you had, for example, the parliament in Canada had, you know, it's 400 plus MPs sort of all on Zoom, not an easy place to have any sort of conversation or discussion about important matters of public policy. It's what technology also can't do is replace that feeling of actually being in the same room as someone or having conversations that aren't necessarily scripted or brought together. It's an inadvertent meeting, whether it's bumping into someone outside, you know, seeing seeing someone in kind of like even the courtyard of an office. So there are certain things that technology can't replace when it comes to sort of, you know, human human nature and human behavior and and i take for example you know the 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 protests that just recently happened a few years ago i mean canada's all, all, all you know for a while prided itself on this very kind of benign you know reputation of you know being a country where everything like civil society works and and things like that and obviously the ottawa protests in some way shook that shook that uh you know sh- shook that sort of belief and what was really interesting was that you had a number of people who, you know, may have come from a different persuasion to a lot of the people who were protesting and then met some of the people who were protesting and were like, oh, these people are actually, you know, they're actually normal. They just seem, you know, expressing a different opinion, but they have the same concerns I have. You know, are my kids going to grow up in a world where they can go- get ahead? Is, you know, maybe climate change seen from a different angle, but things, there, there is a lot more we have in common than what than what divides us it's just that we're we're not we're not in we're not something in the same conversations to to even kind of begin to understand or unpick that and so you know we, uh, while we can't kind of put the put put you know a time stop here on the way technology is going there has to be a manner in which we can sort of think about how we don't completely fall into different silos because otherwise we're just never going to be able to have any constructive conversations. Thank you very much, Kelvin, for your comments there. Now I would like Ernesto. Um, Ernesto, can you comment on this? Uh, on on sure. you know, technology. <clears throat> My feeling is that uh, uh, technology uh, can help or it's supposed to help to build these conversations, but uh, uh, it, it seems that the, the conversation that has uh, a strong amplification in the digital sources uh, supposes to be the correct or powerful or the dominant. No, so uh, as Calvin and Beta said, if you start another conversation and it is it is smaller than the wider one, you will not have the traction to 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 get in constructive one. No? So in, in these cases, uh, and I agree that we all have the same conversation worries worldwide are quite similar. Uh, plus the local ones, no? and, and we have climate change conversations. For example, in Mexico, 
uh, climate, climate change is, is now strategic because uh, government policy goes against climate change. You know? he, he's revitalizing uh, fuel and, and oil technologies and then like a strategic plan that is all the way, the other way of the worldwide uh, tendency. You know? So that's the kind of conversation in which we try to uh, um, enhance and, and be part of. No, uh, uh, but uh, it is it is uh, capsizing to have all the media and government power uh, f fighting against the the, the so civil society conversation no? points of view. So it has been very hard no? uh, at this time. So this the positive positive thing is that uh, we, the different groups in social uh, civil society were getting together, you know, even uh, making alliances, building alliances with opposition to try to get uh, spaces uh, in Congress and, and, and judicial power uh, to, to get more traction in these conversations and get uh, meaningful uh, spaces. You know? This is what's happening in Mexico is very unfortunate. So thank you very much, Ernesto. And and that, that's something with, which I want to like I would like to know from Ernesto, like with the situation in Mexico now, how is how how then for, for Love for All, did, did you have any um uh, how do I say was was there any was it difficult for you to run your festivals even? Um, as you mentioned just now, you know, how the narratives are being built. Governments actually, you know, build narratives and some untruths around, you know, certain propaganda. So for Love for All, how, how do you do that? I mean, I know that you're a festival, so it's in person. But in the case of COVID-19 pandemic, um, mm -hmm. how, how does it work? Do you see uh, a rise in people engaging digitally for you? Yes, for sure. Uh, we, we wrote... Uh... Uh, 10 times uh, going through digital media uh, mm -hmm. and we have uh, we have a, a, a narrative in which we are peaceful we are neutral we try to build and that is uh, all about our narrative but uh, in the side of the government we, you not only have propaganda you have a uh, I don't know how to say they send you the IRS to check your taxes to be paid in order, and you have persecution, internet persecution, and these kind of different dissuasions. Uh, and you start uh, 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 touching pain points uh, for the government. No? So, but but we 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 are together and we stand brave and doing in a peaceful way. And, and maintaining until our president leaves the government that is three years more, hope, hopefully past, very fast. No? Thank you so much, Ernesto. Now, now, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. So now I wanted to go back to, um, and, and we still have time, and I want to go back to Peta. Now, Peta, you spoke about, um, you spoke about just now on DAOs, right? But do you truly think that there can be decentralization? And if you talk about information, and this is where I'm familiar because in, in, in my day job, um, we talk about decentralization of food supply, which is critical these days. But then we realize that the information might not just be accurate. So that like what um, just now Kelvin said, the quality of information. So do you truly think that it can be decentralized conversations between governments and civil society? Who is going to govern that? It's a tricky one. Obviously, yes. we're in an, yeah, it's an emerging, I mean, decentralization as an idea and as sort of a thesis around um, 
societal decentralization and all of these and you know capital decentralization as we're looking at the rise of cryptocurrencies i think there's a lot of problems with a lot of these things obviously we're seeing things move in these directions and i think it's also about understanding that not all decisions should be decentralized because you know there are certain things around infrastructure around you know basic human needs and and, and all of that stuff we need to be making sure that those things are being uh, people are being taken care of and and societies are being taken care of i think when we're thinking more about decentralized decision making it's more around you know helping people feel empowered and taking part in some of the other forms of societal decision making i think around and it's around all of that sort of stuff where you can start to to really start to embrace it and and test and learn with it because i think again you know when we're thinking about decentralization it is sort of like that shift is a, in an early stage and an early um, iteration. And so it's about, you know, starting to, to see if you can do it and maintain uh, the integrity of information, the integrity of, you know, the votes as well, and, and making sure that the right people and right players and you're not experiencing things like um, hacking and, and um, you know, the wrong people sort of getting involved enough that the people that aren't supposed to be. So really, it's a complex shift. And it, it's, a, I think it's, a, you know, we're, we're looking at decentralization on so many fronts. And if you start to think about, you know, all of that stuff that's happening around cryptocurrencies and what that means for power shifts around fiat currencies and what it means to be a nation and and what, what it means to be a country when, you know, perhaps people are spending more on Bitcoin than they are in, um, in sort of those traditional currencies, then anyway, it, it, it's a whole trans. I don't want to uh, derail <laughs> this conversation from where it's meant to be. But, you know, I think it. It's about understanding, you know, what does it mean to be a civil society? Where did the, where do the what, what are the boundaries of my society? Because obviously, you can think in terms of a global society, a national society, and even a much more local one. So, you know, when you're thinking about using sort of some of those decentralized tools, it's like which part of society are you going to use in, and and how big is the community? Because um, you know, when you start to think about that sort of stuff, they are really governed by trust and making sure that um, that the right people are participating in them. So if you start small and then maybe work a little bit further outwards. Thank you very much, um, Prata. That, that was really good points. And now, Kelvin, now you, you come in the intersection of both of their points. So what do you have further comments that you would want to add on before we end this round, Robin, and then we move on to the final comments? I think the 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 other sort of thing uh, I, I I would probably like to touch on very briefly is also with um, with sort of how civil society is now. now um, I, I found that uh, a platform like LinkedIn, for example, has now become in many ways a platform for you know everyone, whether it's government, businesses, and civil society, to sort of suddenly voice their opinion about anything related to sort of any topic, which again, previously was, you know, you didn't necessarily go on to somewhere like LinkedIn to voice your opinion about, say, Nike's, you know, boycott of some, you know, of this football to tournament or, you know, things like, as, as Pat mentioned, you know, a, a, a Ukrainian grandmother versus a Russian soldier. And I think there, there seems to be a lot of, you know, again, a number of kind of crossings over of, of different sort of, I, I wouldn't call them intersections because, Sometimes intersections can be kind of, you know, uh, welcome. But I feel like there's sometimes a bit of a jumble between, you know, between what people, you know, what people sort of think that they, you know, th that they should offer to the world for a click, for a like, versus, you know, how good public policy or how sort of, you know, civil society or, or say, law, you know, general activism used to function or should function. Thank you, Kelvin, very much for that. Really appreciate that example. I absolutely agree. Now, LinkedIn has become a platform for numerous type of topics. It's no longer just my profession, my expertise, and hey, you know, look at my CV digitally, right? So it's become, and I've seen because of the what what what's happening in Ukraine and, and, and Russia, that everyone is going that, like what Peta mentioned, if you don't support it, support a site, or you, you know, you're, you're almost like you don't care. But actually, that's not necessarily true. Some of us actually just digest information and crisis differently. So thank you for that. So now, um, this is a very interesting topic, like what all of you here mentioned. I'm sure we can add and go on for the next few hours. But um, we only left a 
only like five minutes, under five minutes. And I want each of you uh, in about a minute or two to give your final thoughts and maybe just one solution on how can we empower civil society. Peta, you can go first. I think the key thing to think about is how do we start to build hope about the future? And it's like, how do we start to make people feel empowered that they are co capable of co-creating in something that is going to be better? And I think that will be the key thing um, for driving integration and boosting the role of civil society into the future. And also working with um, private sector as well and understanding that they are they shouldn't be taking the lead um, with important political decision making, but people are increasingly expecting them to do so. So how do you start to bring those things a little bit more closely together and more aligned, but also you know, maintaining that separateness in the, in the areas that that, that that needs to be kept separate? Thank you, Petra. Now, Kelvin, over to you. I think the uh, a, a crucial empowerment going forward is also for civil society to also be a place of having constructive conversations rather than a place where people just shout at each other and nobody listens. It's going to, there's no one solution to that. I feel, yeah. you know, as, as time progresses, perhaps an education, you know, which maybe starts at a younger level of these days of, of, you know, how information, you know, is to be consumed, understood, analyzed. Just some of the, you know, we, we, we touch upon technology a lot in the, this topic. And I think a, a lot of times technology is often seen as the solution to, to sort of everything, but maybe some form of human connection that re-emerges post-pandemic where not everything is done on Zoom. You never know what might happen if people sit in the same room and have a conversation. Things could change. Thank you very much, Kevin. We really like that. And it's true, human connection is crucial. Um, and we have learned that being in our home and being quarantined in the COVID-19 in COVID pandemic has taught us that, hey, you know, we are really social creatures. We, we need to feel the positive energies and energies of, you know, having conversations and being empowered by them. So now, Ernesto, let's have your final thoughts on this topic. In my perspective, it's a matter of representation that all the groups can be represented, uh, listen with empathy instead of sympathy that is not the same. And empathy is being in others' shoes, understanding their needs build bridges uh, of, of understanding and then have these conversations in this way you build trust with trust you build hope and uh, understand that it is a, a matter of resistance time to wait to find the best moments to to open spaces for everyone and then uh, the moment, the correct moment to build these bridges with government no? instead of fighting. So some hits, you have to let pass some hits. No? You don't have, I mean, it's not necessary to fight all the battles. No? You have to let the hits go away and wait for the correct moment. And meanwhile, uh, build these spaces of representation for everywhere. That's, the, I mean, that's what everyone wants, no? to be recognized, to be seen, to be loved, to be secure. So this is... Thank you so much, um, Ernesto. I absolutely agree. I think inclusivity is really crucial for conversations and for boosting civil society. So really appreciate that you talk about love. And I think the world needs a, really a lot of love and hope right now. So, yeah, so we have come to an end of our conversation. It is really short. Um, honestly, there's so many points that could have been touched and expanded from all of you. Now, um, have a good rest. Have a good weekend, everyone. And it has been a pleasure to moderate this panel with three of you um, brilliant panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a kind of idealistic to talk about love all the time, but... Uh... <laughs> Yes. I really, really believe so, and I try to build some formulas in which it, it can become to action. You know? So, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank on, you. on that very right. bright note, thank have you. a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. You too. Have a good nice weekend. weekend. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.